immense plaisir d'accueillir deux personnes qui tiennent beaucoup, Cléo Boulis, and we know each other because of the International Toy Research Association. You are one of the key persons of this Toy Research Association, organizing every four years very important conferences, even world also uh, conferences on toys. And uh, I, as I told Cleo that I would like to have a next one, not an intermediate one, in Fribourg next year to speak about what is a toy. And she's invited because precisely she's a social anthropologist, currently assistant professor at the, in folklore and popular culture at the University of Patras. It's a wonderful field, wonderful field. And she's a long-term research associate of the Peloponnesian Folklore Foundation in Africa since 1981. She studied in Athens, she studied classics, and for us it's very important because we, we do relate, uh, we understand uh, each other. Uh, so, and, and then the folklore, folklore at the University of Thessaloniki and anthropology at University College in London where she has her PhD. And, and that's why I think it will be a very nice evening and she's accompanying us also to dinner. We have a pleasure to welcome Betty Lakin, who, is, who lives in Fribourg, where she's logopedist. And it's very important because not, not just because she's a logopedist, it, she's much more than that. She has her master in logopedia in, from the University of Geneva. She's a member of the Association of uh, Logopedists and she was part of a work group, national work group, for organizing of the World Day of 2019, so this year, on logopedy, on the topic play play and game. And uh, you all received uh, the interview of Betty Lakin in La Liberté, which was very nice because she was explaining how important is play and game in her, in, in her daily practice, daily practice. <coughs> so I think you are just the best person to ex exchange. And so she will react to what Cleo will say, her viewpoint being very modern <laughs> and our viewpoint being very ancient. <laughs> and I think it will be fun. <laughs> so listen to you. Thank you. thank you very much for this uh, invitation and uh, thank you very much for allowing me to participate, to attend this uh, wonderful workshop which has been very, very inspiring for me. And uh, I think philology has been a very intimidating subject even though I studied uh, classics I sort of ran away towards <laughs> anthropology because I was intimidated by the subject. But now I realize there are a lot of bridges, a lot of common topics, and uh, we can communicate indeed. And I'm very glad that, uh, that this is happening. And thank you, Veronique, for making this uh, happen. So I'll start with a story that before I enter my field. A few years ago, David Kushner, who was then the president of the American Association for the Study of Play, TASP, uh, which is an interdisciplinary group of play scholars, mostly but not exclusively based in the US, well, David Kushner addressed TASP members through the pages of its el electronic newsletter, Play Review, by asking them to answer the following question. Now, this is a question that archaeologists would love, I think. If a toy sits in a forest and nobody ever plays with it, is it still a toy? From the perspective of a child and of a child and an, uh, and an adult interested in child's play in, in, in playful response. The toy only becomes a toy when it is played at, and any object can serve as a plaything, at least for children older than three years old, as we know thanks to the work of developmental psychologists such as Greta Fine, Catherine Garvey, and Doris Bergen, to name just a few, who have extensively studied young children's interaction with toys. So your answer to the question would probably match other scholars' contributions who ascertained that toys achieve their full meaning only when the, 
the child actually plays with it. My perspective, however, is that of a researcher of material culture, which inevitably involves adults <coughs> and children and toys. And toys matter to adults too. They always play. One, one does not stop playing with childhood, as we know. In my answer to the journal, I raised the issue of cultural construction of meaning as a dynamic process involving the interplay of subjects and objects across space, time, and sites within trajectories from production to consumption. Now, if we assume that the toy is located in a Western context, where I would most like, it would most likely be an industrial product, a product designed, produced, and marketed as a plaything is still a toy, even if it never reaches its, its target group of consumers and users, be it children or adults. It will not have much of play value, as toy producers mention, but it will still be a toy. <laughs> I'm sorry. As, as educators understand it, but it will still fall into the conceptual category of toy. My answer further suggested that the object toy is not an empty vessel. It arrives to the child already laden with cultural meaning. For example, it encompasses ideas about childhood, age, gender, social class, ethnicity, to name but a few. Some of these meanings may be transformed during play as ethnographic and historical accounts of non children's toy and uh, children's toy play suggest, such as the work of Elizabeth Chin or Miriam Foreman Brunel, and my own research among Greek children. If the object never fulfills its final goal, to be played with by the child, it still, it still carries these meanings as a cultural product of a particular society in a given historical period. This point is best illustrated if we follow material culture theorist and anthropologist Arjuna Padurai's view of commodities as things with social lives whose meaning is not fixed but changes as the, the commodities move into different social, cultural, and economic contexts through space and time. Although Padurai dealt mainly with the social life of commodities, his approach was later applied to material culture in general. Regardless then of whether the toy in this hypothetical question is a commodity or a gift or an object produced ad hoc for the sake of play, a useful way, way to consider questions regarding the meaning of all cultural objects, including toys, would be to follow Igor Kopitov's biographical approach to things by examining the cultural biography of the toy. Looking at toys in terms of tracing their cultural biographies would involve following the toy trajectory from the moment of its production and design up to its final destruction, which is what biographical approaches to things suggest. If an unused toy is, is discarded in a trash can, the possibility of a second life is open. It might end up in a museum. It might serve as material for the construction of another object or another toy, as Susie Serif's work on recycled objects and recycled toys shows, it will be recognized as a toy by the person who endows it with a second life, provided that this person partakes in the same culture that produces the meaning toy for this object. The approach to toys that I will develop in this paper relies strongly on theoretical tradition in consumption studies opened up by the work of Apadurai, Douglas and Isherwood, McCracken, and Daniel Miller, and recent developments in the sociology and anthropology of child consumption, such as the work of, uh, works of Elizabeth Chin, John Phillips, and uh, Daniel Cook. Now, the John Phillips' work is especially interesting because she discusses toys as means for constructing family ties. And so actually, the toys in her work actually perform 
the and, the, and reproduced the family ties. And this is a perspective that uh, interests me, especially in this uh, paper, in the three case studies that uh, I will examine. Uh, the, the, the three case studies that I will examine span a rather large uh, time period from 1989 to 2006. This is a uh, an ongoing project that uh, I am still uh, working on and I use it uh, uh, as teaching material with students. But I have chosen these uh, three cases to discuss uh, toys as means for reproducing family ties and, and uh, toys as means for talking about past, uh, present, and future. So it's links between uh, uh, the notions of uh, time as well. So we'll first uh, discuss uh, toys as uh, intergenerational links. Uh, first, uh, a bit of theory in this. Since the publication of the pioneering works by Douglas and Isherwood and Arjun Apadurai, anthropologists studying consumer goods have argued that consumption is not the end of the process of circulation of commodities, as economists have argued, but rather it includes, it also includes the circulation, the use, the maintenance, and the discarding of things. So consumption is a more dynamic process in anthropology than uh, in classical economy. It involves uh, more stages in using the object. So and it ends with, the, uh, with the, the total destruction of, uh, of the object. And um, Colin Campbell's uh, theory on uh, consumption is especially useful in that respect, as he was the first to argue that consumption is a cultural practice that includes to maintenance, repair, disposal, and of any commodity as possession. Now, toys as possessions have been studied in play theory and research in terms, usually, in terms of the makeup of children's collections. And we find that especially in uh, feminist theory, where uh, the question has been on where and when uh, gender socialization starts. So uh, feminist uh, theorists have studied a lot the makeup of uh, children's connect collections in order to, to discuss uh, the beginning of uh, gender stereotyping in uh, children's uh, thought and in children's behavior. So the, the, a lot of uh, the literature has focused on what the, a, to a child's uh, toy collection includes and the, the distinctive features in that uh, collection. A further trend in recent <coughs> literature includes the affective aspects of toys representing the in, and in line with the affective turn in uh, social sciences. So there is a lot written by social scientists, not only by psychologists, on how children and adults relate to toys in affective uh, terms. However, far less researchers have actually dealt with the process of dismantling a toy collection such as the discarding or preservation, or have focused on the relationship between toy divestment and toy transmission. So there is far less research on what happens to toys after the end of childhood. There is some work there, and uh, especially by uh, anthropologists who also have archaeological training, because they are interested in rites of passage. But uh, there is, there, it, it is still a small area compared to the huge literature on the makeup of toy collections. These are some of the questions that I have chosen to pursue in the following paper. So the, I focus on the process of separation and transmission of uh, toys. And uh, the three case studies will all focus uh, on examples of uh, either separation or transmission. So there will be examples of uh, transmitting toys to next generations as bonds between generations and as continuity in different conceptions of, of time. The idea that toys may constitute links between generations derives from my fieldwork that led to my PhD thesis in 2004 
and my experience as an associate researcher of the Peloponnesian Folklore Foundation, where I curated uh, not only the toy collection, but also other objects. But uh, it was the first, uh, my first encounter with toys was through the collections of the Peloponnesian Folklore Foundation. And it was there and then that I decided that this is a field I want to pursue by studying the social meaning of, uh, of these toys that arrived to the museum. Although as an anthropologist of childhood, I have mainly focused on the way toys are used during play, my focus on the materiality of play, which also includes space as well as toys, has led me to discover that play isn't all that is involved in toys. During the year of my fieldwork in Paleophokia, uh, we'll talk about Paleophokia later, I discovered that children's toys were often regarded as decorative items and were put on display in several rooms of the house, living room, parents' room, and par excellence in children's bedrooms. The toys of display had a high chance of surviving rites of passage to adolescence and of being preserved. These toys, I concluded, may serve as intergenerational links, materializing mater maternal bonds to the families, to the family's children, and a sense of continuity between past, present, and future generations. Today, I wish to develop on this idea of continuity by discussing this Fokian material with two more case studies, one exhibit and a toy collection that was uh, donated to the Peloponnesian Folklore Foundation in uh, 2002, and the exhibit was uh, organized in 2005-2006. Uh, I first will start with the examination of the example of Fokia. Palea Fokia is a, a rural, in, uh, as far as a rural community can be today. It's also a tourist resort today, but uh, at the time, I did my field work. Uh, people were still uh, agriculturalists and uh, fishermen, as well as uh, uh, tourist uh, entrepreneurs. So I describe it as a rural community in the outskirts of Athens. It is 52, located 52 kilometers southeast of Athens, near Cape uh, Sunion. It's on the way to near Sunion. It was founded in 1928 by refugees from, uh, Asia, uh, from Asia Minor after the defeat of the uh, Greek army from the, the Turkish army in 1922. So uh, this, uh, this place was offered by the Greek government to the, the Phokians, uh, who actually chose it because it resembled their homeland in, in Turkey. It, so it had the, the morphology of the landscape was uh, the same. In the, in the community, there was also a big group of uh, Greek Albanophone locals, as they were called, and uh, Sarakatan pastoralists, and also Greek uh, transmigrants from, uh, and uh, Greek Cypriot uh, transmigrants who worked uh, in uh, local factories in Lavrion. That was before the deindustrialization of, uh, of Lavrion. So there was a working class uh, background in a lot of the families. The situation of housing was uh, quite crowded for the standards of uh, Greek housing at uh, the moment. But nevertheless, there were 21 out of the thir uh, 34 of the families that I visited actually had a bedroom in the house that was uh, preserved for, uh, for the children. In, other, um, in the other houses, the, the rooms had uh, multiple functions. So the kitchen and uh, living room served also as study room or uh, bedroom for, uh, for children. Now, the children's bedroom was the room where most toys were kept, but it was far from being the only space where toys were stored or exhibited. Children's toys were often found in parents' rooms, either as a means of parental control over expensive toys, such as Playmobil, for instance, uh, settings, or large uh, vehicles, especially in the case of boys who are renowned for destroying toys. So it was a means of controlling a valuable item. Or as part of the room's decoration, symbolizing, I think, 
maternal attachment to her children, as it was the mother who was ultimately responsible for the maintenance and arrangement of decorative order in the house, and who also taught the children to keep this decorative arrangement in their rooms. Children were uh, responsible for keeping order in the rooms and for the decoration, but it was the mothers who overlooked this. Children's rooms were subject to size, meant to sleep, study, and toy play, in the case of uh, younger children. The rooms were characterized by, conserve, uh, by concern for saving space, so we had bunk beds where possible, or folding tables and sliding desk tops, and a more generalized concern for a certain type of stylized and highly decorative order centering around two main features, enclosure and display. So we have, uh, in, uh, in terms of the room, here is what I mean by a decorative uh, st uh, stylized order that uh, includes decoration. So this is uh, an example of a girl's room, which has toys on, on top of um, the curtain shelf there. And we shall see more decorative aspects of, of rooms there. But as a rule, the uh, tiny toys or very functional toys as sport games were stored away out of view, while toys that had, especially dolls and soft toys, that had any decorative aspect were put on display regularly. So either on, um, on shelves, on uh, curtain rods, on beds, above beds, and uh, even hanging from lampshades, as we shall see here. And this is a, a mixed gender room. This is a little girl who shares the same bedroom with her two older brothers. And she has a, a part of this room is uh, her own space. And you can see the toys that uh, signify her gendered space in, a, in the room. So toys played a central part in the ornamental scheme in, chil in children's bedrooms, with dolls and soft toys in a prominent position, even in boys' rooms. Dolls and soft toys sat in orderly rows of other groupings on anything in the room that resembled a, a shelf, curtain rods, heaters, bookcases. Rag dolls hung on walls above beds, often indicative of the gender of the child who slept on it. So this is uh, this little girl, Garifalla, had a rag doll on top of her, her, bre of her bed, while her two brothers had Rambo mm -hmm. on, above uh, their, their beds. One of the things that struck me when I first saw girls' toys was the display or general maintenance of some dolls in their original packaging. Now you can see one doll on the curtain shelf that with original packaging here. Here you can see more on the bookshelf. And here you can see that to uh, when I ask the girls to show me their dolls, they actually produce them in their original wrapping. Now this was something that struck me as very odd. It reminded me of uh, Greek migrants in, uh, in Germany who kept, who, who uh, purchased uh, washing machines and kept them in their original, original wrapping for the time they would return to Greece. Mm -hmm. So it was a, a way of uh, showing that something is very valuable and also a promise for uh, for the future. So this. This struck me, it's, it starkly reminded me of this uh, attitude of uh, migrants, but so I started asking uh, girls why they keep their, uh, their dolls in the original wrapping and if it was the mother that asked them to do so. Mm -hmm. What, uh, well, you can imagine that uh, the, the girls were, had not <laughs> thought of this uh, question before, so they answered, well, we keep them in their original wrapping because we want to, pre to protect them from dust and to, to preserve them. It's nicer, the book, in the box they look uh, nicer. So my initial interpretation of the encased toys was associated with a more general concern against pollution 
the, the polluting dust, as Mary Douglas has discussed, dust as out of place, as out of the thing that disturbs the social order. Uh, and uh, keeping uh, this uh, order was one of the mainly, anyway, ma the mainly daily tasks of housework that uh, girls seem to produce both in their play and in the room maintenance. However, as I looked more carefully at my material on instances of toy maintenance and preservation, answers given to me by some, girl, some girls like that, I already told that we keep them in the box to protect them from dust, seemed to me that only partly addressed a bigger issue, especially as in many cases, toy preservation seemed to transcend one generation and enter into the next. In many homes, for instance, mothers had preserved their toys and they actually exhibited them in their children's room. So uh, this is right here. So the, in this case, on the, on the shelf above, above the curtain, we have the mother's toys. The mother is in the right corner. She sits on the right corner. And it's her toys that uh, are in her two girls' bedroom. Her girls also uh, put their toys on display. So the, the ragdoll that is uh, hanging from the, lamp, the, the lampshade is one of her daughter's toys. So I thought that uh, this was uh, interesting, that the, the children's bedrooms also included mother's toys. When I went back to the field in uh, 2002, 2003, and 2004, and uh, discussed with the children that then participated in my main, the main bulk of my field work in 1989, who were then young adults planning to start a family of their own, what they had done with the toys of the childhood, of their childhood. I discovered that some of the toys that were part of room display that I had photographed back in 1989 had survived through various house moves and uh, other processes and were stored in lockers as both as a result of children's initiative or their mother's interpretation of their child of their children's uh, wishes and some of the girls i interviewed who were then uh, young adults actually told me that they had preserved the toys for the time that they would have their own children so not only as mementos of childhood, as memories of, the past children, of uh, their own past childhood, but for the children that they would have in, uh, in the future. If homes, as uh, Pauline Garvey has argued, are intersubjective spaces constituting catalogues of memories and emotions, children's bedrooms could be read as intergenerational spaces where maternal bonds to existing, as well as we shall see in the other examples, future children were materialized in the, in the presence of maternal toys or in the act of paying attention to the preserving dolls and other toys for the future. Dolls in boxes or the concern for the longevity of a toy or doll could then be interpreted as materializations of the concern for a girl's future as mother and as a means for providing a sense of family continuity. And I will next turn to my second example, where many of the preserved toys of past childhood were transmitted to and played by a second generation of players. Uh, this, uh, the, the toy that you see here, the Playmobil ship, was one of the toys that uh, actually made it to adult to adulthood and was preserved by uh, children on their own initiative. So I next move to my second uh, case study on the toy exhibit uh, Once Upon a Time in St. Basil's workshop, where I will uh, discuss the fate of preserved toys and uh, toys that are transferred to the next generation of players. Uh, a few data on this uh, exhibit. It was organized in 2004, to, to, to December 2004, January 2005. The venue was a primary school uh, of Athens where I collaborated 
with the Parents and Teachers Association for the this uh, for, for mounting this uh, exhibit. This uh, school had uh, a tradition of mounting uh, exhibits and uh, of. Uh, uh, mobilizing uh, the whole uh, school community towards uh, cultural goals and uh, they had organized exhibits on the past so I proposed uh, this theme and uh, uh, 170 different toys yielded uh, in the this hunt of uh, toys of the past uh, generations. The way I worked through this was uh, using the school structure to address parents and grandparents and uh, the school, uh, the primary school children asked their parents and their grandparents to bring a toy that they thought would uh, rep was representative of their childhood for an exhibit on uh, what St. Basil, St. Basil is the equivalent of uh, Santa Claus yeah, in, uh, in Greek, so he is the deity that brings toys. And it is, of course, it is a hybrid form of Santa Claus uh, and uh, uh, other uh, several European traditions. The Greek uh, actual tradition never associated uh, Saint Basil with toys, but uh, with, with uh, prosperity, uh, with general uh, prosperity. And uh, Saint Basil was an ascetic feature. Uh, feature. Uh, he was not uh, fat, and he did not. Uh, carry toys, but uh, he started being associated with uh, the American Santa Claus and Père Noël in the, the end of the uh, 19th century, and it was mainly the upper middle class, the classes that uh, brought this uh, tradition which trickled down to uh, the rest of the Greek society in a process that lasted about 50 years, so until uh, 1960 to 1970, the entire Greece uh, in the most remote villages used the myth of the St. Basil as a, the, a deity that brings uh, toys to, to children. So it was a, a, a metaphor that could be used to, to address parents to bring uh, toys to the school exhibit. Uh, participants were 45 children, 27 boys and uh, 18 girls. The participation of boys is rather high uh, and uh, it, is, uh, it is unlikely that usually men uh, participate less in these projects than women, especially when it refers to the past or when it refers to something that represents uh, childhood. But in the case of boys, because boys will be boys, and boys are the symbol of childhood, usually, they uh, actually participated in a very playful way in uh, bringing toys to this exhibit and also in mounting it. They uh, had a very active role in uh, creating play scenes with uh, the toys, and you can see the, some of these play scenes in, uh, in the army that uh, you have there on the, the top uh, shelf. Uh, you, the, most of the toys that uh, appeared in this uh, exhibit had very interesting stories to tell because they spoke about both about uh, past childhoods but also were very much associ associated with stories about social bonding. So the children knew the stories of these to of, the st of the toys. So you see on the right, on the far right, you see a German doll that was brought by an uncle who was a, a migrant, uh, a Gastarbeiter in, uh, in uh, Germany. And the, 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 the doll had this uh, mechanism. So this doll represented for the child that used it a bond with the maternal uncle. These are two of these dolls. The kangaroo on the, on the floor next to the, the, the bag of uh, St. Basil is a diasporic toy. The, and so it, uh, it is a memory of uh, the, the family's location and its trajectory from Australia to, to Greece. 
and uh, it was uh, the main reason that it was preserved by the family and was also passed on to the next uh, generation. So school, the, the primary school children were actually acquainted m with most of these toys, except of the cases where even their parents did not know that the toys had been kept by their mothers. Uh, there are two possibilities in uh, preserving toys. One is that the child actually act uh, actively asks his uh, or her mother to keep one toy because it has a special meaning for her or for him. But in many cases, it is the mothers who, in the uh, when at the end of childhood, during transition to adolescence, where children are asked to separate with uh, their toys in order to move on to the next uh, stage of the of the life cycle. It is there that uh, mothers usually interfere with uh, what with the fate of these toys and uh, decide and uh, make decisions about what is going to happen. So part of the to uh, of the toy collections that my according to the interviews in, in uh, this uh, exhibit were dismantled and they were part of the of this, uh, the toys were given to charity. Part of the toys were given to other relatives and. Important toys, for several reasons, were kept as memories of the past childhood or and, there's another always an and to this, and with the intention of keeping these toys for a next generation of players. Even if it was uh, the mothers, they were thinking as future grandmothers. Mm -hmm. Children are thinking as, uh, as future mothers. So we have this issue of, uh, of continuity. Mm -hmm. And it comes time and again in all the stories that are uh, related by uh, the people who have uh, played with them. And this um, has, an, uh, it's, it's the same with uh, toys that are produced by the industry and the same with uh, handicraft, uh, handicrafted toys. Handicrafted toys have, uh, if they have uh, a high quality, like uh, this, the, um, uh, the, the doll in the middle, which is uh, manufactured after these two dolls. These are the, 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 to the dolls that flank the middle doll, are Klubius and Suglita, who are uh, 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 heroes of uh, puppet theater. And they were very uh, popular in uh, the 1960s up to 1980s. And you see a Humpty Dumpty doll. These uh, three dolls, the, the two dolls were produced, they were manufactured by a grandmother who was uh, also an artist and uh, made her living through uh, working for a famous uh, toy shop in Athens, uh, Magyaros. So she worked uh, for this, and uh, she was very skilled in making dolls. So one of the reasons that uh, these uh, dolls were kept was because they had uh, a, sp uh, a very uh, effective meaning for uh, the person who created it, and also for uh, the, uh, the daughter who played with them. Other uh, toys such as these had other stories uh, to tell about migration or about loss. This is the case of the, the owl. The owl is a maestro and it's a clockwork uh, operated toy. And this was the only toy that uh, a girl had uh, saved when uh, her family left uh, Istanbul in, uh, in the, the, the 1960s and uh, came to Greece. This was a forced uh, expatriation after the, the 1950s. Again, there were clashes between Greeks and Turks in, uh, in Istanbul, and the family left with uh, few personal belongings. Part of these belongings was this toy because it had a very special sentimental uh, value for for the child because it was donated by her to her, it was gifted to her by her Armenian godfather. So it was a very special toy by a very special person. And when the 
the girl grew up and she was a mother of a, a school child in the school that uh, we, we did the exhibit. This toy was passed on to her son and he actually played with it and she told the story about it. Other toys had uh, other stories to tell about adoption. Now, they, this, is a, these are the, this is the case of the little bottle that has miniature toys they, that, were, that were produced in Brazil. And uh, they belonged to uh, a girl who, whose mother had given her for adoption to her sister, who had no children. And this was uh, quite, uh, it happened quite often until the 1960s in Greece, that uh, children in a family uh, that had uh, one, at least one child in a family that had many children would be given for adoption to a, a childless relative. And uh, th so this is uh, an interesting story also that uh, this story uh, tells us. But most of the, of, this, uh, of the toys that you see, especially preschool toys, early childhood toys, have uh, stories to tell us uh, about bonds, about family bonds, about special relatives that, uh, that bring them. And uh, it is amazing that children knew these the, uh, stories. And uh, it, uh, I think it, it affected their decision to preserve their toys, if it weren't their initiative to preserve the toys for the future. Now, this is another case of uh, a doll that I encountered in another exhibit in 2010, which is another story about loss of uh, a homeland. This is a, a doll that was brought by a Greek uh, refugee from uh, the, what is known in Greek history as the, the Asia Minor catastrophe in uh, 1922. This is very rare because I worked with uh, refugees from uh, Asia Minor and asked whether they brought toys with them. This was the first case that I saw of actually a doll that uh, made its way from uh, the old uh, homeland uh, in Turkey in Asia Minor to Athens. And it survived, it actually survived two wars because uh, uh, her house was bombed. Uh, she lived in Piraeus. Uh, Piraeus was bombed in 1941. The girl's family left for uh, the suburbs the, of Athens. And when she returned to see wh what happened to her house in the rumbles of her house, she found the doll and took it. Mm -hmm. Because it uh, resembled, again, because it resembled not only the lost homeland, but the bonds with the persons who brought the, uh, the doll. So these are the collections of the last homeland. And now I will move to my next example, which is a story about modern childhood separation rituals. So a Greek version of Toy Story. And this is where the uh, photograph comes from, from a wonderful exhibit that was organized in Paris, mm -hmm. Des Jouets et des Hommes, where Veronique uh, also uh, wrote a very interesting uh, piece in um, the catalog. And actually, this was the first time that I <laughs> encountered your work through this uh, catalog that I was uh, asked to, to review. Now, the Toy Story trilogy, in my reading, and in uh, uh, also in the uh, in Gilles reading, who, is, who was the curator of the exhibition and the catalog, Toy Story is about uh, the f uh, is exactly uh, it, it focused on separation, on modern separation rituals, of children separating from their toys, and the fate of these toys in the modern market. Uh, the, the, the toys in uh, the third part of Toy Story, they either end up, they end up, they have a happy ending because they, they are threatened by entering the market. So they are threatened by being bought by a toy collector. But they gain a second life by uh, ending up in a crash. And the, the, the children in the crash are not very 
uh, good with their toys, and in the end they are donated to a child that continues the affective relationship with the toy and properly uh, uses this toy as an affective item. So I will speak about this uh, process of separation and the process and what happens to toys and uh, their trajectory and how some toys end up in a museum collection. This is my third example. So the story that I will now tell begins with a rite of passage to adulthood. A friend's decision to convert a storing space to a multifunctional room, which, is, which means a, a reception room for her 18-year-old daughter, a guest room and bedroom. As this friend lives in the same block of flats, it so happened that as I was made, waking my way to the main entrance door on a spring day in 2002, I stumbled into several cartons with apparently unwanted things. Ina, my friend and her daughter Mary, had been clearing the storeroom the entire previous weekend to create a space of privacy for Mary, a first year technical college undergraduate, and a newcomer in adulthood, adulthood. As my connection to the Peloponnesian Folklore Foundation has made me alert to disposed items, I got interested in the carton's contents to discover that two of these cartons contained these toys and other toys. And it was a typical collection of global dolls and toys that were locally produced and uh, marketed in the 1980s for girls aged 3 to 13. So you have also, you have uh, Greek toys that were produced by Greek manufacturers and uh, global toys. My guess was correct. Ina and Mary had decided to go through the separation phase of the passage to a new stage of the life cycle by disposing remnants of previous stages, including the material culture of Mary's childhood and were planning to ask me if the museum was interested in adding them to their collection. Now, Mary, who was born in 1984, had gone on through a same uh, or, or a similar, in her, on her own initiative, through a similar separation phase when she entered uh, adolescence. At, at the dawn of her teens, she donated a large quantity of her toys to younger children who were offspring of a mother's friend. The content of the cartons comprised the toys that had survived. Now, in the process of documenting the toys for the donation procedure, I discovered that some of the toys were actually, now these are typically you know, cabbage bag dolls, my little pony, uh, produced by El Greco, who was later bought uh, by the global enterprise of uh, Hasbro in uh, 1992. El Greco does not exist anymore, but only as a brand for Hasbro. Now, the, this toy and these little toy and these toys were a generation older than the collection that you saw here, than these toys. So that started posing questions for me. These toys actually led me to a network of uh, more people involving three generations of users and to new, a new series of museum donations. The toy that actually sparked this domino effect was this wooden pink doll, complete with potty covered by a wooden lid. It originally belonged to Manya, a close friend of Ina. This is Manya. When Manya, who was a mother of an only son, decided sometime between 1990 and 1992 that she wasn't going to have another child, she transferred some of the toys of her childhood which were pieces of crafted doll's furniture, we shall see them in the next photographs, to Mary, who was my friend's daughter, Ina, and Dinah, who is this young lady here, 
the daughter of another mutual friend who was also Manya's goddaughter. Mary, this is Mary, was not particularly fond of the pink armchair with the, the potty. She thought it was awkwardly big and old fashioned to her, but she used it mainly as a seat for her cabbage patch dolls, especially during the phase of outgrowing toy, toy play, when most of the time her dolls were used as decorative items. Dinah, on the other hand, played a lot with her share of her godmother's toys, but her share included these toys. They were the four pieces of a, a doll's bedroom furniture. You, sh you see here the wardrobe, the bed with the linen, here, the dressing table, and this uh, wonderful little stool. Mm -hmm. They're all hand uh, embroidered. And the, t the stories that are, are fantastic that these uh, toys uh, have to tell us. Now, Dinah, uh, um, you put Barbie and her male Greek uh, equivalent uh, of uh, Ken, uh, John John, who was produced by El Greco by the time. Uh, she, so she, used, she put Barbie and John John in the bed. She used the wardrobe and the dressing table for several dolls' accessories. And uh, Dinah highly valued these uh, pieces of furniture because they were different. They were original. They were well-crafted. These are her words. And because of her emotional attachment to her godmother, she also considered them as her own toys. Now, this is another interesting story. Even though the terms of transmission turned this gift into something like a long-term loan, to be returned sometime in the future, well past the years of her childhood. So what was interesting was both the story these toys were telling about, the people who used them, and the conditions of their transfer and use. Manya, the goddaughter, or the, god, the godmother who actually gave these toys to Dinah, Manya had given her childhood toys to the girls to play with provided that they were handled with care, as she had declared the intention of claiming them back if she ever had a, a granddaughter. Now, she had a son, so she gave them to the girls to play with. But if she ever had a granddaughter, she wanted them back. So this furniture was a typical example of what Annette Weiner, drawing on Moss's theory of the gift, has termed inalienable possessions. Now, uh, a possession ha be ha becomes an inalienable, inalienable object, an object which remains to attach to the original owner even when it is circulated in exchange. And this is the, the way that uh, both Godelier and Moss have de and Wiener have discussed inalienable possessions. So the toys were in alienable positions because they kept this feature of the owner. Because the toys were given as a long-term loan, the girls had in mind that these actually belong to their godmother. They could play with them, but they would sometime in the future have to give them back. So they represented also the childhood of their godmother. Inalienability, according to Janet Hoskins, to the anthropology Janet Hoskins, who has written biographical objects, is a characteristic of any object that becomes steeped with biographical significance. This is where Manya's story should be told. Manya is this lady, so this is, she is the original owner of these toys. And this is where we should tell her story. Manya was born and raised in Egypt in 1952. So again, she was a member of a diasporic Greek family. She was the second child of a Greek diasporic family whose ancestors had established in Alexandria in the beginning of the 20th century. Her father and maternal grandfather were employees in a Greek-owned cotton gin near the city of Minia. And the family lived in industrial accommodation reserved for the family personnel. 
The bedroom was actually a miniature of her mother's bridal bedroom, reflecting dominant taste trends of the late 40s and early 1950s. Both miniature and adult bedrooms were designed by a Greek carpenter who was a close friend of Manya's parents. They were subsequently manufactured by the, a local craftsman who, and were given to Manya as a Christmas present when she was four or five years old. Her mother, Nita, who was an expert on embroidery, sewing, and crocheting, had sewn the bed linen and decorative cushions and had catered for providing the carpenter with matching materials for the dressing stool. So, so she helped with the linen. So the carpenter actually manufactured the wooden part and the rest were uh, Mrs. Nietzsche's creations. The pink chair was bought. It was a, the pink chair was a commodity that was bought at a local department store of Minya that imported toys from France and England. All pieces of furniture, regardless of origin, commercial or crafted, were used by Manya on a daily basis during doll play with her favorite doll, her baby, who accompanied her in all her movements through from Egypt to Greece. In the early 1960s, as Nasser's reform drove foreign capital and most diaspora Greeks out of Egypt, the family settled in Athens. Doll and furniture survived through the family's move to Athens and were played with until adolescence, until Manya's adolescence. When Manya outgrew doll play, her mother Nita stored the toys with Manya's consent because of their high symbolic value, the craftsmanship involved, in their construction. In Manya's word, they were, and in her mother's, they were good pieces. Why shouldn't I keep them? So they were highly valued. And with the intention of handing them over to Manya's children. Manya's decision of donating the furniture to the museum was a product of several oscillations. It was partly determined by the absence of a daughter who would safeguard the toys' inalienable, inalienable qualities as a piece of family heritage. And partly, it was also driven by, driven by the fear that rapidly changing toy fans and children's preferences would constitute a further obstacle to communicating the toys heavily symbol and laden to the potential grandchildren. After all, her, her son was only 18 at the time that she decided to donate these pieces to the museum. In other words, if her friend's daughter, Mary, treated the pink doll chair as an outmoded, odd, inherited piece, the possibility of a similar lack of appreciation by a granddaughter born to a son was far bigger. As part of the collection of a museum, however, the toys would gain value as national heritage. In her own words, I can always take her to the museum, her future granddaughter, to show her grandma's toys was her concluding remark when she phoned me up to announce her decision to donate the toys to the museum. What do the discussed examples suggest about the meaning of toy preservation beyond childhood? One could argue, in agreement with uh, Susan Stewart, who was uh, written extensively on, uh, on souvenirs as uh, and uh, on toys that uh, represent the past. That the, the, the way that uh, Susan Stewart uh, treats uh, souvenirs is uh, very similar to the Lieu de, de Memoir that uh, Pierre Nora uh, discusses about uh, the objects as uh, sites of, uh, of memory and uh, <coughs> modern uh, Contemporary dealing of uh, lieu de memoir also includes uh, the uh, affective parts of these sites. So it's not only memory and treating of history, it's also bonds that uh, objects uh, preserve. So one, well, one of the way of uh, looking at these pieces was to go along with uh, Susan Stewart's analysis of souvenirs as the mainly representing the loss of things, so mainly speaking about uh, trauma. 
Um, and a lot of these toys that we saw in, um, in the exhibit actually do speak about loss. But it's not only about loss or past or trauma. They actually speak about the hope of things. Mm -hmm. So the future, the bonds, and the, the family continuity also speaks about uh, continuity and the hope of things. So it's not only memory. And of course, speaking about past is never only speaking about past, because past is read through present eyes, and, and it affects both both the present and uh, and the future, and it has uh, reading the past has a lot to tell us as historians have argued about how we understand uh, the present. So history is a bifurcated process. The act of collecting and recollecting memory is closely linked to the future, as in the case of most objects donated to museums. So it constitutes a medium for conveying messages to later generations. In my material that I discussed from my thesis on the material culture of children's play in Fokia, I had argued that toys are structurally related to trousseau, to, especially to the preparation of uh, trousseau. There, both the toy, the meaning of, uh, of of toy preservation and preparing trousseau are future oriented. They are oriented to towards the the quality of a girl as a future, uh, as an adult woman, a housewife, and uh, a future mother. Toy preservation and building a collection of a trousseau, of course, is exhibited, and it has been exhibited. Uh, even in uh, the 21st century. The last Trousseau display that I attended was uh, during the making of a bed in uh, a wedding I attended in 2014. So it's uh, quite alive even in, uh, in today's uh, ra uh, radical changes of, uh, of marriage and uh, cohabitation. Of, uh, of persons as, uh, as uh, couples. But uh, the, the interest in, in the future is still there among uh, families, especially among mothers. So toy preservation and building a, co a collection of trousseau are both features of the same process of social reproduction. Both practices share a concern with and an investment in the future. Collecting trousseau for girls constitutes a social aspiration towards the ties between future members of the new family. The act of preserving further stresses the mother's relationship to her children and reproduces social expectations of girlhood as a preparation for motherhood. Children, especially girls, actively engage in the reproduction of gender and family ideology by participating in both processes by consenting to or promoting the preservation of their toys for the time they will have children of their own, and by collecting trousseau to build the homely environment necessary for their upbringing. In the act of donating a collection of toys, which has constituted a family's inalienable wealth, the, the museum is also entrusted with the duty of preserving this personal heritage for a future generation and transforming this personal and family heritage into either a communal or a national heritage. Toys in this case are transformed from an objectification of childhood and family to the constituent parts of Greek nationhood. Rather than making, than, as Susan Stewart has argued in her discussion of souvenirs, rather than making public events private and moving history into the personal, I argue for the case of uh, the toys that I have discussed, that these inalienable toys, when they are donated to museums, they actually make private events public and they move the personal into history as part of a national or a local cultural heritage. Diane, thank you for your time. So now we open the discussion in Belgium. I'm sure you have plenty to, to 
français, en français, ça va aussi. D'accord. Alors tout d'abord, merci à notre Google pour votre super présentation. Comme vous avez dit, les jouets sont des instruments culturels et sociaux qui nous sont transmis par la société, mais également par la famille dans laquelle nous vivons. Et c'est vrai que les jouets sont des objets qui ont une histoire familiale et une valeur affective et qu'on donne aux enfants pour qu'ils puissent s'amuser et prendre du plaisir avec ces objets. Et justement, le plaisir qui est amené par les jeux, ça va jouer un rôle très important dans le développement d'un individu. Parce que premièrement, les jeux vont amener un cadre ludique, détendu et sécurisant qui va être vraiment bénéfique pour les apprentissages. Et en plus, un jouet peut être exploité de mille et une façons. Et en cela, il permet d'aborder de nombreux domaines du développement d'une personne, comme le développement de sa motricité, son développement affectif, sa communication avec autrui, son langage, son imagination, son raisonnement logique, ou encore euh, sa capacité à mémoriser. Et on voit que les jouets sont source de plaisir, mais c'est aussi, euh, aussi la voie royale vers les apprentissages chez les enfants. Et je vais maintenant brièvement illustrer aussi la vie sociale d'un jouet, mais aussi l'influence que le jouet a dans notre vie sociale, du point de vue de la psychologie du développement. Et ce jouet, c'est le ballon. Donc c'est un jouet que vous connaissez tous, je pense. Et c'est un objet rond qui a été fabriqué à la base pour être roulé, lancé ou rebondi. Et c'est vrai que si on prend donc, le développement d'une personne depuis qu'il est tout petit, depuis qu'il a un an par exemple, un enfant de un an à deux ans, il reçoit ce ballon et puis il est tout content. Et il va faire de l'expérimentation active avec ce ballon, en jouant avec, avec ce ballon de façon répétitive. C'est-à-dire qu'il va prendre ce ballon et il va le lancer de différentes façons et observer les résultats qu'il obtient. Par exemple, il lance ce ballon contre le mur, il le lance fort, ça c'est son action, et il observe, le résultat c'est que le ballon il revient fort contre lui. Après, il essaie de le lancer lentement, et il voit que le ballon il revient aussi lentement. C'est ce qu'il observe. Après, il le lâche, enfin, le ballon il rebondit ou il ne rebondit pas. Et puis donc l'enfant il, il va lancer le ballon de différentes façons et de façon répétitive. Et à force de faire ça, il va intérioriser les mouvements du ballon et les résultats qu'il obtient. Donc il va construire une image mentale de ses mouvements et de ses résultats. Et en construisant ces images mentales, ben, il n'aura plus besoin après de lancer le ballon pour savoir ce qu'il va faire, parce qu'il va pouvoir le prédire. Il va dire « si je lance le ballon de cette façon, je vais obtenir ce résultat ». Donc en réfléchissant de cette façon, l'enfant est en train de construire un raisonnement logique. Mm -hmm. Ensuite, ce même enfant est grandi, il a entre l'âge de 2 à 6 ans, et puis là il est en train de développer le jeu symbolique. C'est-à-dire qu'il est en train d'apprendre à jouer, à faire semblant, à faire comme si. Et à ce moment-là, avec ce ballon, ce même ballon, il peut faire comme si ce ballon, c'était un coussin. Donc, il peut faire son blanc dormir. Ou il peut faire comme si ce ballon, c'était son animal de compagnie, par exemple son chien. Donc, il peut faire comme s'il caressait le chien, ou comme si le chien, il aboyait. Et on voit donc que le ballon, il joue un rôle différent. Donc, il va acquérir une signification différente de celle qu'il avait au départ. Et avec ce nouveau rôle qu'il tient, l'enfant va pouvoir rejouer des scénarios de sa vie quotidienne où il va pouvoir inventer de nouveaux scénarios. Et par exemple, justement, il va faire semblant de dormir ou il va faire semblant de promener son chien. Et puis, on, avec ce jeu symbolique, l'enfant va, euh, euh, il va, il va pouvoir développer et utiliser son imagination. Il va pouvoir exprimer ses émotions et il va pouvoir imiter les adultes de son entourage. Et en imitant les adultes de son entourage, il va s'approprier les règles, la culture, et aussi les comportements de sa vie sociale. En fait. Et ensuite, l'enfant, il grandit encore, et dès l'âge de 6 à 7 ans, 
euh, ben, il découvre, il développe les jeux de règles. Et selon le jeu auquel il va jouer, que ce soit le football, le volleyball ou la balle au camp, l'enfant, ce ballon, il va encore jouer différents rôles et il va aussi acquérir différentes significations. Et avec les jeux de règles, l'enfant, il va pouvoir, donc il va apprendre à respecter les règles du groupe, du vivre ensemble, et puis il va aussi apprendre à gérer sa frustration. Euh, là, je suis perdue, je ne suis pas content, mais voilà, il faut que je gère cette frustration. Ou bien, et il va aussi apprendre à collaborer avec autrui. Et pour les étapes du développement ultérieur, ben, on voit que l'amour du ballon rond reste toujours présent pour beaucoup d'adultes. <rire> Même bien plus tard. <rire> Donc on voit que euh, c'est vrai que les jouets ont une vie sociale euh, dans laquelle ils vont tenir différents rôles selon leur contexte d'utilisation, mais aussi selon l'âge, euh, la culture, euh, les préférences de leur utilisateur, et qu'en échange, les jeux vont aussi influencer, moduler notre vie sociale en, en affectant notre développement social, affectif et intellectuel, et ils vont nous accompagner dans l'appropriation de notre culture. Donc voilà, j'ai trouvé tout ce que vous avez dit très intéressant et ça fait sens. c'est que vous aviez pris le ballon. Anna, ça vous fait pas penser à quelque chose C'est extraordinaire. Vous n'avez pas pris de poupée, vous n'avez pas pris une voiture, vous avez pris une balle. Or, oh, vous ne pouvez pas le savoir, parce que Anna a comme principal jouet des enfants grecs, sur les petites coé qu'on dit des antistériques, c'est des balles. À part le chien et le, le bâton à roulettes. Et ça, c'est vraiment extraordinaire. Donc, euh, c'est vraiment une vieille, vieille histoire hein, de tous ces apprentissages que, qui se font au travers d'un objet qui nous paraît au premier abord anecdotique. Vraiment, on se dit, mais pourquoi montrer ça Ça n'a aucune importance. Et là, vraiment, c'était magnifique. C'est une super démonstration de tout ce qu'on peut en retirer et qui peut, qui peut résonner avec les images qui sont sur ces, ces petits bases. Merci beaucoup. Est-ce qu'il y aurait une question directement pour une des personnes Sinon, ce qu'on vous propose, c'est de se déplacer pour aller manger ensemble. Ça fait partie aussi de la social life. <rire>